الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وصحبه وحزبه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير صدق الله مولانا العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما With love and affection together recite الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيد يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيد يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيد يا رحمة للعالمين وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا شفيع المجبين My respected brothers, elders and sisters and mothers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I thank you and welcome you once again to our monthly lecture الحمد لله The last time we spoke about Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq رضي الله تعالى عنه His life, his works and his achievements And today inshallah عز وجل I intend to speak about the miraculous night journey of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our attendance, our efforts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a gathering, a gathering of forgiveness. May Allah make this a gathering, a gathering of knowledge, a gathering of nur and light for us in this dunya and in the hereafter. Uh, first disclaimer, first thing that I'd like to mention is that the topic of the Mi'raj and the miraculous night journey of the Prophet وسلم, a full detailed analysis of it requires several lectures. Not one lecture, but many, many lectures. So in this uh, one and a half hours that I have, inshallah, I intend to summarize some of the main salient points of the story of the Mi'raj, the Isra and the Mi'raj of the beloved Prophet وسلم, speaking about giving a brief synopsis as to what happened why it happened, what was the wisdom behind it, and what events took place during the night journey of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. My sources are the Qur'an, Surah Al-Isra from the Noble Qur'an, Surah Bani Israel from the Noble Qur'an, which is in the 15th part of the Qur'an, and I recited its opening verses, Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. It's the 17th Surah of the Qur'an, and ayah number one, is in reference to the journey, the night journey of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu So our so, um, first source that I will be speaking around is the Noble Qur'an and uh, Surah Bani Israel and also Surah Al-Najm from the Qur'an and the other sources are Sahih Hadith in Sahih Al-Bukhari the long Hadith in Sahih Al-Bukhari about the Mi'raj and there is a, a long Hadith about the Isra and the Mi'raj and there's a long Hadith in Sahih Muslim about the Isra and the Mi'raj of the Prophet So these are our major sources. And then we have, these are our primary sources for the story of the Isra and Mi'raj. And then other than that, we have our secondary sources. And our major secondary source is this book called Al-Anwar Al-Bahiyya Min Isra'i Wa Mi'raji Khayr Al-Bariyya which is written by the late Muhaddith, scholar of Hadith uh, of Mecca who passed away in 2004, uh, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi Maliki Makki. Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi uh, This book of his on the wisdom and on the events of the, the story of Mi'raj which is based upon hadith books so it's based upon like Zad al-Ma'ad of Ibn al-Qayyim and Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani the commentator of Sahih al-Bukhari So that's just a disclaimer because I'm not going to be focusing a lot on references during the speech I'd like to just mention that in the beginning that these are my sources that I will be speaking from inshallah azza wa jal. So what happened and when did it happen? Um, so it was a Monday and the Monday as you've probably heard me speak about Mondays before is a very significant day in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu It was the day he was born. Monday was the day he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Monday was the day the 17th of Ramadan when he received the first revelation. Monday was the day that he entered Medina Sharif. Monday has a uh, a very special significance in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Monday was also the day uh, in which the Prophet ﷺ traveled to the heavens. The miraculous night journey, the Mi'raj took place on Monday. And Monday, it was the 27th of Rajab, 
the 27th of Rajab from the Islamic calendar when this happened according to the most popular opinion among the scholars. <coughs> what year was it? It was between the Prophet ﷺ when he went to Ta'if. Remember when he went to Ta'if ﷺ and the people of Ta'if did not welcome him. In fact, they retaliated. They began hitting him ﷺ for his da'wah. It was after that and it was before his migration to Medina. So it was either two years before migration to Medina or either three years before migration to Medina. There is a slight difference of opinion on that. But it happened, uh, we know clearly, just before migration. Okay, just before the beloved Prophet ﷺ traveled to Medina Sharif. What actually happened on this night, there are two parts to the journey of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. How many? Two. two parts. There is a land journey and there is a heavenly journey of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. Now the land journey is called Isra. The land journey is called Isra. Isra. Yeah? And this has been referenced in uh, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al haram in that surah, the opening verse of, of that surah that I recited. So the isra is the land journey. The beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken by Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam, who is Sayyidul Malaika, the lead lord and the master of, the, of all the angels, and by Hazrat Mika'il alayhi salam. The two famous angels, they came to the beloved Prophet ﷺ when he was in Mecca. They took the beloved Prophet ﷺ, they, first of all they washed his heart وسلم, with the water of Zamzam. They placed a golden uh, vessel in his heart, a golden plate, which came from Jannah, as mentioned in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, which was filled with light and hikmah, which was filled with knowledge and wisdom. It was placed into, inserted into the chest of the Prophet ﷺ, and then his chest was sealed up. Okay? Then the beloved Prophet وسلم, and this miracle of the opening of the chest and the washing of the heart happened four times in the, in the life of the beloved Prophet It's known as the Shakku Sadr, the Mu'jiza of Shakku Sadr, the miracle of the opening of the chest. Four times the heart of the beloved Prophet وسلم, was opened by the angels physically and it was washed. And on the night of Mi'raj, just before he وسلم, was about to be taken to the heavens, his heart was washed. And the reason why this was happened, there are many reasons, but one of the major reasons was so that the beloved Prophet ﷺ could actually bear what he was about to go into. Okay? It prepared him ﷺ, to actually see the signs of Allah in the heavens and to meet with his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was why the heart was one of the reasons why the heart was washed just before he ﷺ, was taken by the angels. He وسلم, was uh, taken on a buraq. A buraq was an animal that was slightly uh, uh, taller than a donkey but shorter than a mule. And it was the buraq was known as the animal of the previous prophets. This buraq was from heaven. Okay, it was an animal that was from heaven and it used to be the animal of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam used to ride it in his life. The beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, mounted this and then he sallallahu alayhi salam, was taken with the angels to Jerusalem to Palestine. And there in Palestine you have Al Masjid al Aqsa, okay? The hallow the hallowed house. The hallowed house, Al Masjid al Aqsa is the furthest mosque. Muslims have three harams, three sacred sanctuaries. Mecca, Medina and Al Masjid al Aqsa. These are the three harams of the Muslims. And unfortunately the haram the third haram, third sacred sanctuary of the Muslims is as we know, uh, under oppression today and under the, the control of other people. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieves the Muslims from the test that they are in in Palestine at the moment. Amen. So the Prophet وسلم, went to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. On that night, he was taken by the angels. Now the buraq, the animal that he وسلم, rode, its speed was so fast that wherever its gaze would fall, that's where its hooves would fall. Okay, its feet would land where his where the eyes of the animal would, would could see. So that's how far the animal would move. That was the speed of the the speed of the buraq, as mentioned in in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari. That speed of the 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 buraq, the animal. When the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he uh, went to Al Masjid Al Aqsa, the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there he received uh, all the previous prophets and messengers that had passed away before him, they were all there in the masjid. Now, this is an amazing thing. They had passed away, they were in their graves, right? 
They passed away and they were. But look at the lives of the prophets. The lives of the prophets after they, uh, uh, after they pass away. That they were there in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, They were there behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there two rak'ahs. Two rak'ahs of salah and they prayed behind him in Jama'ah. Okay? Each one of them met him. Sayyidina Adam Alayhi Salaam met him. Imam Qadi Iyad. All the major scholars of Hadith mention this. Okay? Imam Ibn Hajar Asqalani in his commentary of Bukhari, Imam Badruddin Aini in his commentary of Bukhari, they all mention this. In fact, they even mentioned that there's a, uh, did they come with just their souls or was it their bodies as well? And there's a view among the scholars of Hadith that the Prophets came with their bodies. Okay? They came with their bodies and they prayed behind the beloved Prophet So at one time their bodies were in their graves and behind the Prophet And you think, how is this possible? It is Allah who makes this happen. Nothing, this isn't impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who made the night journey possible for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can make this happen for the prophets. We know in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallam passed by the grave of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ra'aytu Musa wa huwa qa'imu yusalli fi qabrihi. I saw Musa whilst he was praying salah in his, in his grave. Now I think the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is on this dunya, and Musa is in his grave. And the Prophet can see beyond, see beyond the limits of this dunya and can see Hazrat Musa salam praying inside his grave. And then the same Musa is in Al Masjid Al Aqsa when the Prophet gets there. Oh, oh, oh. The same Musa salam is in Al Masjid Al Aqsa when the beloved Prophet gets there. And when the Prophet goes to the heavens from there, the same Musa <coughs> is in the heavens. Oh, oh, oh. It's all mentioned in Sahih Hadith. All mentioned in Sahih Hadith. Okay? So this is the miracles of the, the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this happen. This is from the creation and the absolute qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes this happen. This is not impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do. Okay? So the beloved Prophet sallam joins with the prophets there. And each one of them, the major ones, Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, Sayyidina Dawud alayhi salam, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, Sayyidina Salman alayhi salam, uh, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, they stand up and they praise the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in al Masjid al-Aqsa. Then the beloved Prophet leads them in prayer. Now this journey took place in a very short part of the night. And if you were to do the land journey on a normal camel, for example, then it would take one month from the city of Mecca to al Masjid al-Aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this happen in a short part of the night. <coughs> Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan. This tanween is for tankir, the laylan, the two fathas, the two zabars that you see indicates that this happened in a short part of the night. Okay, laylan, it happened in a short part of the night. So there the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led the anbiya kiram, led the mursaleen, and there were seven safs all together, there were seven rows. The first three rows were of the messengers, and the last rows were of the angels. Okay? And there the beloved Prophet recited قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ أَنْ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ in the two rakahs that he led Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the beloved Prophet وسلم, was taken uh, on a heavenly ladder which is known as Mi'raj. The there was a ladder that took the beloved Prophet وسلم, into the heavens and that ladder is called Mi'raj. That ladder is called Mi'raj. So the land journey from Mecca to Al Masjid Al Aqsa is Isra, and Isra means to to uh, to travel at night, to travel at night. So that land journey is Isra, and then the Mi'raj of the Prophet وسلم, is from there onwards, from Al Masjid Al Aqsa to the heavens. Okay, and the beloved Prophet وسلم, was then taken on the Mi'raj with the angels, the first heaven, the second heaven, the third, to the seventh, then to Al Bayt Al Ma'mur which is the Kaaba of the heavens. The Kaaba of the heavens is a, is a building right above the Kaaba of the world. Okay? There is a building in the heavens, which is the, just the way we have the Kaaba, and we have humans uh, making tawaf of the Kaaba on earth, we have a Kaaba on the heavens as well. And that is the Kaaba of the angels, and they make tawaf there. Okay? And that is known as Al-Baytul Ma'mur. Al-Baytul Ma'mur. So the beloved Prophet ﷺ went to Al-Bayt al Ma'mur, then he went to Sidrat al-Muntaha, which is the low tree, which is outside of paradise. It's a huge tree, there's nothing like it. It's, uh, it's a beautiful tree uh, with diamonds and, and jewels on it. The beloved Prophet ﷺ described it, and it's outside of paradise. 
Then the Prophet ﷺ went to the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beyond the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is an amazing journey of the beloved Prophet ﷺ where he sees what happens in heaven, he sees what happens in hellfire. Okay? And then he meets with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, Oh Muhammad, what do, what do you want? So this is the most highest peak of the event of the Mi'raj which inshallah I intend to cover later on. I'm just giving you a brief introduction as to what happens in the story of the Mi'raj. And the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there he meets with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, he sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his eyes. And Allah was not in any direction. Allah had no color. Allah had no form, by the way. But how is this possible? Allah made it possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it possible. Allah has no forms, no limb, no direction, nothing like that. Okay, but how is this thing possible for a human being to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his eyes? This is the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, it is the uh, unanimous aqidah of all the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They agree that on the day of judgment, all the Muslims will see Allah with their eyes. On the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, every Muslim will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his eyes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not have any shape. Allah will not have any form, He will not have any direction. <laughs> this is the most amazing thing. Now we think about it, we think how is this possible? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it possible. Okay? But the only person to actually see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his eyes in the dunya was our Prophet And that was on the night of Mi'raj. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke with the beloved Prophet And the Prophet then came back down to the, uh, to the earth and came back to Mecca and all this happened in one short part of the night and in the morning he sat there alone thinking that what am I going to tell my people they won't believe me the people of Mecca won't believe me they try to find any excuse just to belie me okay just to expose me so what am I going to tell my people what happened and inshallah I will try to address that inshallah if we have uh, enough time so this is what happens uh, the event this is a summary of of the event of the miraculous night journey of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. Now what are the wisdoms? Why does it actually happen in the life of the Prophet ﷺ? And the time of it happening, why did it happen then? Uh, these are important questions. There are many wisdoms. We can probably enumerate about 10 to 15 wisdoms behind the story of the Miraj, but then I will be focusing too much on that, so I don't want to do that. So if I was to summarize some of the, the four or five wisdoms behind the Miraj, one of the major wisdoms uh, for the Mi'raj is that it's happening in Mecca. And don't forget that the life of the, uh, the Mecca, the life of the, the Meccan period of the Prophet ﷺ is a life in which the Muslims are ridiculed. The Muslims are oppressed. Okay? The Muslims are wronged. Okay? And the Prophet ﷺ is desert, he's deserted by his people. He's left alone. Okay? People are not giving him support. Okay? And the Muslims are oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ has just been hit in Ta'if. And he saw Salam bled from his, from his uh, feet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it was this point of time, the Prophet sallallahu was emotionally struck. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then provides him that happiness and calmness and that coolness and that tranquility and serenity and that happiness by bringing him to himself. Okay? Is to, to give, that, give that empowerment to the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at this point of time. So that's one of the main reasons it happened at this point of time after the story of Taif. The second wisdom that we know in the, in the event of the Mi'raj of the beloved Prophet وسلم, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, nobody has seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except the beloved Prophet وسلم, in this dunya. Okay? And everybody says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that Allah is one. And that there is no Lord except Allah. Tell me, when you have a, a, an incident, an accident, or something happens, or, or, or something happens, an enormity, or an accident, or an incident, and if you were to, uh, to go to court as a witness, if you had not seen the event, would you be accepted as a witness? <coughs> you wouldn't. But each one of us is a witness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? How can me and you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, when we haven't seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that making sense? None of the, all the prophets said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, but no one had, none of them had seen Allah. They had spoken, they had heard from Allah, they had spoken to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and had been spoken to by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, but they had not seen 
with their eyes they had not seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay so there was a there was a need for one to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah then when he says ashhadu an la ilaha illallah everybody else would say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah because he said ashhadu an la ilaha illallah okay our shahada about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on our our trust of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he had seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that making sense Okay, so the Prophet said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. So his shahada is greater than ours. Because we heard his shahada and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And he saw that. And then he testified, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. So his shahada was with his eyes. And our shahada is through our ilm. His shahada is with his eyes. And our shahada is with our ilm, our knowledge. See the difference? Our shahada is the shahada of ilm. And his shahada is the shahada of ru'ya. The shahada of ru'ya, the shahada of seeing, the shahada of iyan, the shahada of actually seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there was that need for the one to actually see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then say, I witness that Allah is one. And there is no Lord uh, other than Him. And with that came the, fi the, the finality of prophethood. Now testimony had come to an end. The testimony had been perfected, so there is no need for a prophet after the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so with that came the khatm al the finality of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A third wisdom as to why the mi'raj happened in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is a beautiful reason, is that Allah subhanahu wa taala had made our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the king of the universe. And there is not one but many hadiths from Sahih Bukhari, from Sahih Muslim that indicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given had had uh, given the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the ikhtiyar, the authority over the heavens and the earths. He had authority. Look, he he split the moon into two because he had authority. He brought the sun back for Sayyidina Ali Salat al Asr because he had authority. The beloved Prophet sallam, was taken into the heavens and he traveled because he had authority in those areas. Otherwise, you're not allowed to trespass anybody else's land. <coughs> Agree? You're not allowed to trespass anybody else's land. But the beloved Prophet them went into the heavens because it's his, it's his, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's under his authority, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he's rahmatun lil alamin. And when we say he's rahmatun lil alamin, he's the mercy to all mankind means all the universes, including the heavens and the earths and whatnot. So the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he was the king and he had authority over everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to honor him by making this king travel in his kingdom. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored the beloved Prophet وسلم, to travel in his kingdom, just the way a king would travel in his kingdom. And the beloved Prophet وسلم, saw that his name was written on the walls of Jannah. He وسلم, saw that his name was inscribed <coughs> with the name of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq on the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He saw this on the night of Miraj. Okay, so his kingdom was inscribed on the arsh of Allah. The Prophet's kingdom was inscribed on the, the the leaves of the of the garden of Jannah. The Prophet saw his name inscribed on the leaves of Jannah. This was to show the beloved Prophet وسلم, that even though the people of Mecca yet were not accepting him, were oppressing him and his people, but look at your kingdom, O beloved وسلم. We have given you so much that you don't have to worry about anything. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Okay, so it was to establish the kingdom of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And uh, to this effect the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said I have been given the keys of the treasures of the heavens and the earths This is a sound hadith of the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That he has the keys of all the treasures He has the keys of all the treasures of the heavens and the earth. This is a sound hadith of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. أُعْطِيتُ مَفَاتِيحَ خَزَائِنِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ. So he was the king sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the king was taken to travel in his kingdom, and not just that to see the signs of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And this is why it's mentioned لِنُرِيَهُ إِنَّ الْقُرْآنَ لِنُرِيَهُ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا. The purpose of that journey was so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So that we can show him of our signs. 
It was the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show the beloved Prophet sallallahu And what were those signs, inshallah, we're going to uh, look at them briefly. But I'm still speaking about the wisdom as to why the Mi'raj happened. So the third wisdom, the first one was that the, the beloved Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi was, was given comfort because of what was happening in his life in Mecca. And the second reason was that he had shahada of the ayn, of the eyes, by seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he had the most perfect shahada. The third reason was that the beloved Prophet ﷺ was told to travel, was made to travel in his kingdom and was shown the signs of Allah. The fourth wisdom is that in Mecca what had happened was that for a number of days revelation had stopped. Revelation had ceased for a number of days. So the Prophet ﷺ did not receive anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some people of Mecca they began saying that Muhammad's Lord has left him. Astaghfirullah. Yeah? The Lord of Muhammad has left him, has abandoned him. Because he's not talking to him, he's not communicating with him for a number of days. So they began saying this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took the beloved Prophet وسلم, from the earth to the heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then said, وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا طَلَى I swear by the morning and I swear by the night when it spreads. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا طَلَى Your Rabb has not abandoned you, your Lord has not left you. How did he do that? By bringing him to the heavens. So to, to, uh, to falsify what the people, to clear the Prophet of that, that thing, that, that negative thing they were saying, that his Lord has left him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him to the heavens and said, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Rabb has not abandoned you and your Rabb has not left you alone. And the, the moment to come for you in your life will be better than the previous moment. This was happening on this, according to one narration, this surah wa duha al alam mashrah were given to the Prophet on the night of Mi'raj. This was a part of the conversation they had. It's amazing. The moment to come in your life. According to one tafsir, the life that you're going to have in Medina is going to be better than the life that you have in Mecca. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَىٰ وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَىٰ O oh, beloved, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you so much that you will be pleased with Him. O oh, Habib, O oh, beloved, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, your Lord will give you so much that you will be pleased with Him. And this takes me to the, the final wisdom as to why the beloved Prophet was taken to the heavens. Is that the beloved Prophet was always concerned about his ummah. That's me and you. Okay? He was always concerned about us. The beloved Prophet even though we might not be concerned about him, he might not mean much to us and might not have much relevance to many of the Muslims' lives today, unfortunately. We say his shahada and we believe in him, but there's little that we know about him. There's little relevance that we give him in our lives. But he وسلم, was concerned over us. And he was always concerned about our fate, about our destiny, about what's going to happen to us. Are we going to be good and go to Jannah or are we going to go to Hellfire? And because the Prophet was always concerned, like a father is always concerned over the children, a caring father is always concerned over his children. The beloved Prophet was a spiritual father of all the Ummah. And the beloved Prophet ﷺ was always concerned as to what is going to happen. The fate of the, the Ummah and the beloved Prophet ﷺ wanted a guarantee. Wanted a guarantee from Allah that he will finally send his nation to Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him to the heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there said to him, Wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. Oh beloved, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to him, Your Lord will give you so much. That means that on the day of judgment, when your ummah is brought in front of me, okay, and when I when I make a judgment on their account, then I will forgive them. And what will happen? Fatarda, I will forgive even that last person that I had sent to hellfire from your ummah, I will take him out. Fatarda, and then you, Muhammad, will be pleased on that day. This is Surah Wad Duha. Everybody should know Surah Wad Duha. Okay? Surah Wad Duha, wa layli ida sajaa ma wa da'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Wa lal akhiratu khayrun laka min al ula, wa la sawfa yu'atika rabbuka fatarda. The, pro- the beloved Prophet brought a guarantee on that night that even the people, the sinners from this ummah, from us, the sinners will, some of them, will go to hellfire. But eventually, 
the Prophet ﷺ will intercede and he will cry in the court of Allah asking for everybody to be taken out from his ummah to the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove even that last sinner from his ummah that will go to paradise because of the night of Mi'raj. That, that guarantee was given to the Prophet ﷺ on the night of Mi'raj. So those were some of the, the main um, wisdoms behind uh, the, why the Mi'raj happened in the life of the beloved Prophet ﷺ. Now I want to relate to you some of the events that took place, some of the signs that the beloved Prophet ﷺ saw on the night of Mi'raj. As he ﷺ was traveling, he saw uh, some people on this journey. And what he saw was that they were sowing their seeds into the land, and on the same day they were reaping the land. They had harvest. The seeds gave, their, gave harvest on the same day. And what they were doing was they were eating from their harvest, and then the harvest was replenished again. So when they took from the harvest, there was more harvest. And he looked at this as a, as, as a ma in amazement. And the Prophet ﷺ asked Sayyidina Jibreel Oh Jibreel, what is this? What, what is this sign? And Sayyidina Jibreel ﷺ said, Oh beloved Prophet ﷺ, These are al-mujahidun. These are the strivers in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They strive in the, the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every good deed that they do is multiplied. <laughs> Every good deed they do is multiplied by 700 times. And whatever they spend, it returns to them. Then the beloved Prophet ﷺ passed by another group of people. And their heads were being shattered with a big stone. Their heads were being shattered with a big stone. And then their heads became normal again. And then they were shattered again. And then they were becoming normal again. And then their heads were being shattered with the stone again. So the beloved Prophet ﷺ asked Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, said, oh Jibreel, who are these people? And Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam said, these are the people whose heads were too heavy on their pillows and they could not get up for prayer. Allah. These are the people whose heads were too heavy on their pillows and they could not get up for the obligatory prayer. The Prophet ﷺ was being shown what would happen to these people. Okay, may Allah give us tawfiq and Himma, inshaAllah, today people want to fight like the battle of Badr, but they cannot even uh, fight for the battle of Fajr. <laughs> okay? The beloved Prophet وسلم, said these people were being beaten with a stone, okay? and their heads were being crushed. The punishment that is being shown to someone that does not keep up his obligatory prayers. Okay? May Allah protect us from that day and from that shame that we will have. And from that disgrace that we will have to face on that day. May Allah allow us to prepare and open our eyes and realize now, inshaAllah. Then the beloved Prophet ﷺ passed by another people. And he saw that they were wearing uh, loincloths. And loincloths are uh, really thin cloths that just covered their front parts and their back parts. And loincloth is, is usually worn in uh, warm countries. So the beloved Prophet ﷺ saw these people and they didn't look quite human. They were humans, but they didn't, look, they didn't look quite human because they were standing and roaming around like camels and sheep. And they were, they were eating, um, what were they eating? They were eating white hot coals of hellfire. And they were eating and they were chewing the stones of hellfire. And they were eating zakum. Who knows what zakum is? You know what zakum is? No, zakum is the cursed tree. It's mentioned in the Quran. Okay? The cursed tree. Okay? The tree that has la'na upon it, has curse upon it, has no mercy on it. Okay? This is a tree that is created in hellfire. It's one tree that is, is inside of hellfire. It has thorns on it, thistles on it. Okay? And it doesn't burn with the fire. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed this tree. The beloved Prophet said that what he saw on the night of Mi'raj was these people that were eating around like they were humans, but they were like camels and sheep. And they were eating, roaming around like uh, camels and sheep. They were eating from the tree of Zakum. Astaghfirullah. They were eating the thistles and the thorns and the, the coals of hellfire. And they were chewing on the stones of hellfire. And Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, he said, oh Jibreel, tell me, who, who are these people? And Sayyidina Jibreel said, these are the people that Allah 
gave them risk. Allah gave them wealth. And they had enough money to pay zakat, but they never used to pay their zakat. This is the punishment that they are having. People who do not pay their zakat. What were they doing? They were like camels and sheep. And they were eating stones from hellfire. They were chewing on the white coals of hellfire. They were eating from the tree of Zakum, the cursed tree. And eating the, the thistles and the thorns of the tree. Astaghfirullah. That was their punishment. Because they never used to pay their zakat. And unfortunately this is a big problem in the Muslim Ummah. Many people don't know how to calculate their zakat. And they don't even make the attempt to actually go to a learned person and say, you know what, I don't know if I've been paying my zakat properly. Can you help me? Very few people have approached me, by the way, even from my, our local communities. Or, you don't necessarily need to approach me, but I'd expect that if you have a learned person among you, for example, and you don't know how to calculate something, you would, you would approach them. Now, there are, unfortunately, this is a, a big issue that we have, that the Muslim Ummah is, is cutting off from the tradition, cutting off from the ulama, and not attending their circles, or don't ask them necessary questions. You know, we're more concerned about asking a question about a nara, for example, or more concerned about asking a question about, uh, uh, if we want to learn a nath, we'd run and learn a nath. Learning a nath is not a bad thing. But what about the necessary things about our deen, for which our deen came, and for which the Prophet struggled to pass on to the Muslim ummah? We don't have shawk for that. The shawk for that is dying. How many people have actually gathered together and said, you know what, we want to gather on how to pay zakat properly. What is zakat? Who is eligible? How do we calculate our zakat? What happens if we haven't given our zakat or haven't given it properly, for example? Don't forget, this is an obligation. Just the way five times hajj, uh, five times salah is obligation. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, which is coming soon, inshallah, is an obligation. Hajj what in, in your lifetime once is an obligation. Likewise, paying zakat on an annual basis is an obligation upon the one who, had, who meets the threshold of zakat. So the beloved Prophet said that uh, Jibreel a.s. told me that these are the people that did not pay the alms even from what they possessed. While Allah never withheld anything from them. Allah never withheld. Allah gave them his risk. But they were stingy or they were not giving their zakat. Okay? So paying the zakat, if you don't pay it, this was a sign that the Prophet ﷺ was shown. Now the next point I would like to uh, particularly mention is the Prophet ﷺ, and highlight as well, is that beloved Prophet ﷺ passed by another people and he saw that these people had two pots in front of them and one pot had uh, fresh meat in it, cooked meat that smelled nice and there was a, another pot in which there was rotted meat and they were eating from the rotten meat. You know, I said on the night of Mi'raj, the beloved Prophet ﷺ was taken to the heavens to be shown signs. These were some of the signs he وسلم, saw and he told us about. Okay? The beloved Prophet وسلم, said that I, I saw these people, there were two pots of food in front of them. Okay? There was meat disposed in this one and there was meat in this one. And this, this pot had fresh cooked meat that had beautiful fragrance from, coming from it. But this pot of meat was rotten. It smelt. It was off. But these people were eaten from this rotten meat. And the beloved Prophet وسلم, asked Sayyidina Jibreel السلام, he said, O oh, Jibreel, uh, who are these people? And Sayyidina Jibreel السلام, said, oh, Ya Rasulullah وسلم, these are men from your ummah. These are people from your ummah that had excellent and beautiful wives at home. But they would spend their nights with evil women. They would spend their nights with infamous women, with evil, wrongdoing women. And these are those women from your ummah, O Prophet وسلم, that had excellent, good treating husbands at home, but they would spend their nights with evil doing and infamous men. That day is here in our ummah today. This is a big social problem that we don't speak about on our pulpits and in our masjids and our members. It's a massive social reality. There are so many married men and women that are committing haram. For Allah's sake, open your eyes. There are many, many people out there that have 
not been fortunate enough like you to get married. There are people who've hit over 40 and are still looking for rishtas and still looking for marriage. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you get married early. By the way, it's a gift. Ask those people who are depressed. Ask those people who are in the test of the moment without marriage. What it means to be lonely, ask them. What it means to be alone, ask them. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be married. And then what do people do? They mistreat their wives. They don't show them comfort. They don't provide for them. There are cases that we get, astaghfirullah al azim where the husband has just left his wife to nothing. And he's chilling and he's living his life large with his girlfriends. There are people like that. It's a big social reality. The beloved Prophet described this as a man who is eating from rotten meat. And he's got fresh meat to eat from. Everybody understood the example. Would you eat rotten meat from a rotten pot or would you eat fresh meat that is fragranced and is for you? <laughs> this is the sign the beloved Prophet was shown on the night of Miraj. Allah protect us from that tribulation and that test. Anyone can be tested by this. And it's, a, it's indeed one of the traps of the shaitan. And indeed anyone can get into this. With this life today, with social media and social networking and mobile phones and internet everywhere, 24 hour access, it's an open invitation from the shaitan. It's a big tawfiq from Allah that if you are protected. Big tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm speaking reality here. Okay? So that it's like, just remember next time, that it's like throwing your mouth into this rotten meat. And that's what will happen on the day of judgment. That's what will happen. That's what you'll be eating from on the day of judgment. This, this will be happening to such people. Women who are not pleased with their husbands. And husbands that are not pleased with their wives. And perhaps, inshallah, on one of the occasions we'll speak about marriage life, inshallah. We'll probably do a dars of that as well, inshallah. But just uh, balancing it out, I need to highlight that because that is a big social problem at this very point of time. Then the beloved Prophet وسلم, said that I passed by another, another people. Uh, no, the Prophet said that I passed by uh, a hole. And out of this hole came a big bull. Out of this hole came a big bull. And then the bull tried to run back into the hole. And the beloved Prophet was looking at this on, on the journey. He's looking at this bull that comes out of a small hole. Big bull comes out of it. And then the bull tries to go back into the hole. And the beloved Prophet asked Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, oh, Jibreel, what is this sign? What is this? And Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam says, O oh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, this is, a, this is someone from your community, from your ummah, that says an evil word. And then he feels remorseful, sad, why did I say that? And he wants to take it back, but he can't take it back. He's already said it. You understood? This is a man from your ummah that has said an enormity. He's said an evil word. He said something really bad from his mouth. He's uttered something really bad. But after uttering it, it's like that bull that's come out of the hole and is trying to go back in. But he can't get back into the hole. What he has said cannot be taken back. And he's feeling remorseful. The beloved Prophet said that this is the, the, the example of a person that says something evil to another person and then feels sad that he said it and he wants to take it back, but he can't. Okay? And this is why we should be careful. And when we speak to people, think before we speak. Think before we retaliate. Think before we respond. Okay? And make sensible, reasonable, and thoughtful reactions. Don't become reactive to become proactive. Don't be controlled by your circumstances as to what happens to you. In fact, try to control your circumstances. Is that making sense? Rather than saying, oh, I was in a scenario where I had to respond like that. No, you had the choice to stop, think, and then react. But you didn't. You were controlled by your circumstance, and that's why that evil word or enormity came out of your mouth. And then you regret it later on. For example, people now over a small thing say to their wife, talak, talak, talak. And then they start running to Mufti Sahib and Maulana Sahib. They get so many cases. My dear brothers, nobody gives talak when they're happy. They say, no, no, Sheikh, we were, we, you know, we were really angry. Can you protect us from the talak, please? I've said it, I shouldn't have said it. I'm sad I said it, I didn't really mean it. 
But if you had a big sword and you hit your wife with a joke, would you cut her or wouldn't you cut her? The damage is done. Once you've said the word, the damage is done. You can't come back running to Mufti Sahib or the doctor saying, you know, I didn't really mean it, Dr. Sahib. Can you please kill her now? Talaq is like a sword. Once you've said it out of your mouth, it's gone. You said the word talaq, you intended it or you didn't intend it. Your wife is divorced if you said it to your wife. Because it's a sword. Whether you strike a sword deliberately or whether you do it unintentionally or you do it through a joke, the sword will cut. Okay? And this is a big common problem in our society where people get over trivial small things uh, perhaps there wasn't enough salt in the food, Allah forbid, or perhaps some small silly thing happened, or small things built up, for example, and he just said, talaq, talaq, talaq. And by the way, people think that talaq happens by saying it only three times. No. Talaq is effective even if you say it once. But the one who says it three times, there's a very, there's no escape route for him. And the one who says it once to his wife and then goes to an alim, there is a way that he can have his wife back. So be careful. There is an escape route. If you say it once, there is an escape route. The escape route is a sharia route. You can have that wife back. But if you said it three times, you've completely finished it. So be careful when you get angry. And do not bring those words in your tongue. And nobody, Mawlana Sahib, Mufti Sahib, we were really angry when we said it. We had no control. We were really angry. Well, of course, nobody says talaq to his wife whilst they're joking or whilst they're happy. Right? So be careful of what you utter and think before you utter something. The beloved Prophet wasallam spoke about uh, these people, uh, these signs that he saw on the night of Mi'raj. Then the beloved Prophet wasallam, and many other things happened on the way, by the way, he <coughs> stopped at Bethlehem Okay, Bethlehem, uh, which we know as in Arabic, Baytul Laham. Okay, in Palestine is where Sayyidina Isa a.s. was born, even according to Muslim tradition. And the Bin of Prophet as he was going on the Buraq past Bethlehem, Sayyidina Jibreel a.s. made the, the Buraq stop. The Prophet came off the Buraq and Sayyidina Jibreel a.s. told Rasulullah, this is the Mawlud. The Mawlid, the place of the birth of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, and he prayed two rak'ah nafam there. Seeking blessings from the place. Okay. Then the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, was taken past the Mount Sinai, okay, tour of Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. The Burak was stuck there, Rasulullah sallallahu came off the Burak and he prayed two nafam there as well. It was the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Hazrat. Musa Karimullah alayhi salatu was salam. <coughs> then the beloved Prophet وسلم, was taken into the heavens, the first, the second, third, to the seventh, and in each heaven he met a prophet. Adam alayhi salam on the first one, Hadrat Isa alayhi salam on the fourth one. At Baytul Ma'mur, above the seventh heaven, he met Hadrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. Once again, he met them in Al Masjid al Aqsa, and now and I want you to think. I want you to think about something. But notice how, and I've already mentioned this before, notice how the Prophets are in Palestine before the Prophet وسلم, in the Masjid al-Aqsa. Now they're in front of him. Already there before him. On the heavens. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari itself. How is this possible? What speed were they travelling at? The speed of light. What speed were they travelling at? It's amazing, isn't it? This is the mu'ajizat, the miracles of the Prophets. These distances of the world are nothing for them. They can go to the east and be in the west in a few seconds. Look at the story of the, the throne of Bilqis in the Quran in the story of Sulaiman a.s. How the throne of Bilqis was taken a number of hundreds of miles away by one jinn, Sahabi of Sulaiman a.s. In just the blink of an eye, he brought the throne of the queen to King Sulaiman a.s. This is in the Noble Quran. How the Prophets all gathered in the Masjid al-Aqsa, how they all went to the heavens in, the, in just a moment before the beloved Prophet got there. And there's a question here, why is it that they were faster than the Prophet Why is it that they were? Are you understanding the question? Why is it that the Prophets were faster than him? He's better than all of the Prophets. But at this point you see that all the Prophets were faster than him because they got to the heavens 
each one of them in each of the heaven, say the Adam in the first one, Hazrat Isa in the fourth one, Hazrat Ibrahim above the seventh one, they were there in Masjid Al-Aqsa and then they went to the heavens before him as well. Why did they go there before him? This was to honor him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to welcome him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were there for the istiqbaliyah. They were there to welcome the beloved Prophet and uh, uh, invite him to the heavens. Then the beloved Prophet <clears throat> now moving on to the, the meeting between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beloved Prophet and this was not in the context of space. This did not happen in the context of place. Okay? This was la maka. This was a place where there is no place. And this is the most, this is the peak of the Mi'raj, the story of the Prophet Sallallahu heavenly night journey. Recite the Rushi for Salat wa Salam. Salat wa Salam alayka ya Sayyidi ya Rasulullah wa ala alika wa ashabihi ya rahmatan lil alameen. The beloved Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he reached <coughs> Uh, the Bayt al Ma'mud, then he went to the low tree. From the low tree, he went to the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he sallam, went beyond the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there, there was no creation or creature with him. The angels were left behind. <clears throat> there was nothing with the beloved Prophet sallam, at this point. He was alone. And it was the mercy of Allah that brought him closer and nearer to reality. And the beloved Prophet sallam, <coughs> said, I reached a point. Where he said, I could hear the scratching of the pens. I reached a point where I could hear the inna lawhi mahfuz, where the pens are writing on the sacred tablets, writing destiny. Writing what? The Prophet, Prophet said, I got to a point where all I could hear was pens writing like this on the night of Mi'raj. I could hear scratching of pens. That is one of the highest points that he وسلم, reached where the angels were writing their destinies okay? and the beloved Prophet وسلم, went beyond that and he said I reached he said when I looked at the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there was so much light and I saw a man that jumped into the light of the arsh and they got swamped up in it and I asked Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam O oh, Jibreel uh, what is this? is this uh, an angel? And Jibreel said, no. Rasulullah said, what is this? Is this, is this a prophet? Jibreel alayhi salam said, no. The Prophet said, Jibreel, then who is this that has just been swamped up into the light of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam said, this is a man from your ummah whose tongue used to be moist with the dhikr of Allah. The dhikr of Allah. His tongue used to be moist with the dhikr of Allah. Allah, Allah, Allah. And his heart used to be attached with the masjid. His heart used to be attached to the mosque. And his father and mother never cursed him. Three things. His tongue was moist in his life. His tongue was moist and wet with the dhikr of Allah. His heart was attached to the masjid, to the house of Allah in the dunya. And his mother and father never cursed him. This is a man from your ummah. Look at the rank that was given to a dhakir. Look at, look at the rank that was given to the one who remembered Allah. To the one that was dutiful to his parents. And that his mom and dad never cursed him. Look at this person and look. The Prophet ﷺ is asking in amazement. Who is this? Who is this lucky man that is swamped in the nur of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that disappears in the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is none other than a person whose tongue was moist with the dhikr of Allah, whose heart was attached to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and whose parents never cursed it. May Allah make us uh, among such people. <laughs> then the beloved Prophet got to a point where he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he bowed down into sajda. What did he do? He prostrated. He وسلم, made sajda. And whilst he was in the state of sajda, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, O oh Muhammad, sell. O oh Muhammad, ask what you want to ask. <laughs> Muhammad, sell. Sell. O oh Muhammad, ask what you want to ask. 
And the beloved Prophet وسلم, said, Labbayka Rabbi. Two times he said, I am at your service, my Lord. I am at your service, my Lord. And then the beloved Prophet وسلم, began speaking about the previous Prophets. The Prophet وسلم, said, Oh Allah, you took Ibrahim as an intimate friend and you gave him an immense kingdom. Oh Allah, you gave, Hadrat, you spoke to Musa salam directly. You gave Dawood a great kingdom and you softened iron and you subjected mountains to his command. Oh Allah, you made, you gave Suleiman a massive kingdom and you subjected jinn and human beings to his command. Oh Allah, you gave Hadrat Isa the knowledge of the Torah and the Evangel. And you gave him the ability to cure the blind, naturally blind and lepers. When the Prophet ﷺ said this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And oh Muhammad, and I have taken you as myself, my beloved. He was Khalil, he was Ruhullah, he was Najiullah. Each one of the Prophets had his ranks and had his excellence and uh, has his, had his merits. But the beloved Prophet ﷺ, as he was talking about the previous Prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I myself have taken you as my beloved and intimate friend. I have made you my Habib and Khalil. No other Prophet had that title from the, other than the beloved Prophet This is why we say the beloved Prophet, because he is Habibullah. Each other Prophet had a, had a unique title to him, and the only one known as the beloved of Allah is the beloved Prophet And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this honorary title on the night of Miraj. The title was given to the beloved Prophet on the night of Miraj. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued speaking to the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah said, I have sent you to all people without exception. You have been sent to the black and the white and to all continents of the world. And you are a, as a bearer of glad tidings. You bring good news of Jannah to people who follow you and as a warner to people who disobey you. I have expanded your heart for you. I have? expanded your heart. I have filled it with knowledge and wisdom. And I have relieved your burden from you. I have honored and exalted your name so that I am not mentioned except that you are mentioned with me. Oh, Muhammad, this is the conversation of the night of Mi'raj. This is the peak of the event of Mi'raj. Oh, Muhammad, I am not mentioned. I have exalted and honored your name and raised it so high that I am not mentioned except that you are mentioned with me. I have made your community the best community ever for the benefit of mankind. The Ummah of the beloved Prophet Kuntum Khaira Ummatin Ukhrijat Linnas is the best community that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ever sent to humanity. I have made your community on the middle way. I have made your community in truth the first and the last of all communities. I have made the public address, the khutbah, impermissible, haram for your community, unless they first witness you as my messenger. I have made the khutbah unlawful, unless they mention you and they witness your messengerhood. This is why in our khutbah we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad al abduhu wa rasuluh. Because on the night of Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu I have made it unlawful for the khatib, the one who gives khutbah, that he testifies my testification without your testification. Shahada la ilaha illallah without shahada of Muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, I have placed a certain people in your community. Their hearts will be repositories of the Qur'an. The hufaz of the Qur'an. Their hearts will be storage banks of the Qur'an. <coughs> then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have made you the first Prophet created and the last one sent. And the first one heard in my court. The first soul that was ever created was the soul of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first reality to be created was the reality of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it was the last to be sent among the messengers. And he وسلم, will be the first one whose intercession will be accepted on the Day of Judgment. Okay? When everybody will be waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to release them from the heat of the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet وسلم, will be the first one to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to release humanity 
from the heat of the day of judgment. And then Allah will listen to him and release them. So he's the first one who will ask Allah for something and Allah will give him first. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have given you seven of the often repeated verses. Which are the seven oft repeated verses? Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this on the night of Miraj and he said, I have given you Surah Al-Fatiha which I gave no other prophet before you. I have given you the last ruku, the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, which constitute a treasure from my arsh. The last, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ The last ruku of Surah Al-Baqarah is a gift of the night of Miraj. The last ruku of Surah Al-Baqarah. And Surah Al-Fatiha also was revealed two times. Once it was given to him on the night of Miraj, and the other time it was given to him in Madinah Sharif. So the Fatiha was revealed how many times? Yes. Two times. Once on the night of Miraj, the second time in Madinah Sharif. The beloved Prophet ﷺ was given Surah Al-Fatiha as a gift on the night of Miraj, and the last ruku of Surah Al-Baqarah, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَابَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ as a gift from the Arsh of Allah. There's a treasure box in the Arsh. And that treasure box had these verses of the Qur'an in it. And from that treasure box, the beloved Prophet ﷺ was given the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have given you Al-Kawthar, the well of the beloved Prophet ﷺ, from which every Muslim shall drink on the day of judgment. And I have given you eight lots. I have given you Islam. I have given you emigration, hijrah. I have given you jihad. I have given you charity. I have given you fasting in Ramadan. I have given you ordering good and forbidding evil. And the day I created the heavens and the earth, I made 50 prayers obligatory upon your community. How many? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the day I created the heavens and the earth, I made 50 prayers obligatory upon your community. How many prayers were made for us? Imagine if we had 50 to pray. Just imagine what would happen. Right? We can't keep up to five. I was reading once Imam al-Ghazali and in one of their works, if I remember correctly, they mentioned that if somebody lives 60 years of his life, how many? If somebody lives for 60 years, and in 60 years, if he sleeps seven hours a day, how many? Seven. seven hours a day. If somebody sleeps seven hours a day, and his lifespan is 60 years, he has slept nearly a quarter of his life. 17 and a half years of his life, he slept. How many? 17 and a half years of our life is spent sleeping. Calculate it. Do your calculations. And in the, the three quarters that are left, the amount we spend on just sitting down eating food, calculate that, going to the toilet, to the washroom, having a shower, just using the facilities, calculate that, just driving our car, doing nothing, for example, just calculate that, that's taken a chunk of your time. Then the business that you do, or college, or university that you go to, calculate all that time, and your life has ended. We don't have 10 minutes for one salah a time, a day. It's just 10 minutes. Where 17 and a half years of our life are spent in sleep. And salah takes 10 minutes. Imagine if we had to pray 50. The beloved Prophet ﷺ was given 50 salahs on the night of Mi'raj. And when he came down with 50 salat, Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam told him that your ummah would never be able to keep up to 50 prayers. Go back to your Lord and ask your Lord to forgive the prayers and to diminish them. So the beloved Prophet went up again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced five salats. So they came down to 45. And the Prophet came back down. This is in Sahih Bukhari, this hadith. The Prophet came back down and said, the Musa alayhi said, yes, how many did your Lord diminish? How many did he reduce? And he would say he reduced, he said he reduced five. So you have 45 left? Your ummah will not be able to keep up to 45. Go back to your Lord and ask your Lord to reduce more. And the Prophet 
kept on going back and forth from Hazrat Musa back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then down to Sayyidina Musa to the heavens, to the lower heavens, and then back up to the Ash of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He went down and up and down nine times in the night of Miraj. <coughs> Up and down nine times, as mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. Each time, five salahs were reduced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until he was left with five salahs. When he brought down five, Sayyidina Musa salam said, Go back to your Lord and tell him to reduce them further because your ummah won't be able to pray five. Go the tenth time. And Sayyidina Muhammad Rasulullah said, He said, No, I have shame now to face my Lord. I am. I have shame now to face my Lord and ask Him to reduce the salahs further. Now the thing I want you to focus upon is that notice how Sayyidina Musa Salam had passed away, right? But we're speaking about him as if he's alive. This confirms the aqidah of the Sunnah that the prophets are alive after they pass away. And those people who say those who are dead don't benefit. Tell me. Musa a.s. passed away. Did he benefit or didn't he benefit us? He benefited every single person because he was the one who had the salahs reduced to four, from 50 to 5. So if you don't believe in the, the deceased benefiting the living, then pray 50 salahs. You understood? The second point, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know that ultimately the beloved Prophet ﷺ and his ummah will only pray five, and that Musa will stop him and he will have to go back. And why did this happen then? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could just have reduced them once and should just have given him five salahs and not fifty. Is that making sense? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted his beloved to keep returning to him. We cannot understand that love is beyond our understanding. The Creator who created him loves him so much that he wants him to keep coming back to him on the night of Miraj. And there's an excuse to keep going back. Five salahs, five salahs. Allah could have reduced all 45 at once or given him just five. But then the beloved would have gone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to honor the beloved Prophet in that divine meeting that many times on the night of Miraj. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ kept on going back and forth on the night of Miraj. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, let them be five prayers every day and night. So it was finalized to five, and let every prayer count as ten prayers. So five times ten is equal? Five times ten equals fifty. So let every prayer count as ten. You pray one salah, you get, you get the reward of praying ten salahs. You pray five, you've prayed fifty. Originally, the thawab is, is not diminished. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Let whoever is about to perform a good deed, whoever is about to perform a good deed, even though, even though he does not do it, let him have a reward for his intention. Subhanahu. Just by his intention. And the one who does the good deed, let him have the thawab tenfold. If somebody has the niyyah to do a good deed, you get the thawab right away for doing that good deed even though you don't do it. And the one who does the good deed gets thawab for doing that good deed ten times more than it originally is worth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the night of Mi'raj, this was given as another gift to the ummah. This, this was given on the, on the night of Mi'raj. And whoever is about to commit a bad deed, now look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever is about to commit a bad deed, let him only be sinful once he commits the bad deed. Not by making the intention. You don't get any <coughs> sin for making the intention of doing a sin. You only get a sin. A sin is only written once you have actually materialized. Once you have actually acted out a sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and, and when he does the sin, let it be written as one sin. When you do a good deed, let it be written as ten good deeds. And when you do a sin, let it be written as one sin. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us and upon the ummah of the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After this, the beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned to Mecca. 
Now, I will finish with this, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Uh, the return was an interesting return. It's a fascinating return. What happens on the way back is amazing. The beloved Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he comes back to Makkah Sharif, back to, to, to the home, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he sits there in the morning um, thinking about what his people will actually say when he tells them that he went to Palestine. And then he went to the heavens. What people will actually say and how people will begin to mock him again. Right? They'll say, look, you know, look at him making up these stories again, Na'udhu Billah, and he wants us to believe us that he went to the hallowed house, Al Masjid al Aqsa in Palestine one night. So, a number of things happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned his return for him. Look at the return. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that they were going to attack the Prophet. They're gonna say they're gonna find that chance to say, ah, look, we were telling you that he's lying, astaghfirullah. Look, he's lying now. He said that he went to Masjid al-Aqsa. How can he go to Masjid al-Aqsa? They, they've done this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared the journey on the way back. As the Prophet ﷺ was coming back, he passed by a caravan. A caravan of people and camels. And this caravan, all of the people were looking for a camel that had gone missing. All of them were looking for a camel. They were all looking for a camel. So the Prophet ﷺ passed by and he realized that they had lost the camel and he ﷺ went up to where the caravan had sat and there was no person there at that time because they were searching for the lost camel. The Prophet ﷺ took a water bottle from their caravan and he drank the water. You might ask the question that this water did not belong to the Prophet ﷺ. How could he go into somebody else's caravan and drink the water? Don't forget, he وسلم, has authority over everything in this dunya. It all belongs to him. Rasulullah has more right over us and our belongings than us ourselves. Does that make sense? And likewise, over the belongings and the lives of the unbelievers, Rasulullah has more right over them. Okay, so the beloved Prophet ﷺ drank water from that bottle. And where were the people of the caravan? They were looking for a lost camel. The Prophet ﷺ drank the water and left the empty bottle there. Left it back there in the caravan. Then the Prophet ﷺ proceeded. He carried on on the Burak with the angel Jibreel ﷺ. And then they passed by another, another caravan, another group of people. These people were from Mecca. They were a business group, they were business caravans that had gone to Palestine to sell their goods and they were on their way back to Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ met them on the way back but they didn't notice him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? The beloved Prophet ﷺ said that I saw the second caravan and in that second caravan there was a red camel and the red camel had two containers on it, a black container and a white container. And because it was so heavy the, and there was a big stampede around it, the camel fell and the, its load broke. The load of the camel broke. And everybody, the people of the caravan, they had created a stampede around the camel. The Prophet actually went past them and saw this happening. A red camel on the ground with two white containers on its back and it had fallen to the ground and the containers, the load had broken. And they were all standing around it. And the Prophet saw this as well. Now there was wisdom as to why he was seeing this. When the beloved Prophet ﷺ got back to Mecca Sharif, on the morning, night and the morning came, he sat there sallallahu alayhi wa sallam despondently. <coughs> despondently meaning losing hope. What is he going to tell people? And Abu, Abu Jahl, the non-Muslim, passed the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, uh, has anything happened? You look worried. Has anything happened? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, something has happened. This is the first conversation he's having in the morning. And Abu Jahl says, and what happened? And the Prophet ﷺ said, I was taken last night to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Palestine. Abu Jahl said, where to? <coughs> and the Prophet ﷺ said, to the hallowed house, to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Palestine. He said, uh, and uh, then you woke up here among us in the morning? And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. 
I'm here among you in the morning. Then he thought, you know what? Let me not go back to the people and say to the people that Muhammad is saying this. Let me call the people here. And let me try to expose him. Let people hear this from his mouth. Because later on he might deny it. So he went to his people, to the family of the Prophet Ka'ab bin Nui, the family of Quraysh. Ka'ab bin Nui is the family of the Prophet <coughs> the Banu Hashim. Okay? He said, oh Ka'ab bin Nui's family, come. Listen to what Muhammad is saying. The beloved Prophet and they came up and they said, oh he said he went to uh, uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa last night. And the people asked the Prophet did you, did you go to Palestine last night? Is that what you claim? The Prophet said, yes. I was taken. He didn't say I went, he said I was. Subhan Allah Asra Abdihi. The surah that starts with the night journey starts with Subhan Allah. O people who object on how can the Prophet go? How is it possible for him to do this in one night? Allah starts the surah by saying, Subhan Allah. Glorified is Allah who took the Prophet. Subhanallah. He didn't go on his own accord. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made this happen. Okay? So they said, did you go? The Prophet said, yes. Where did you go? And then the Prophet said, I went to the Halad house, Masjid al-Aqsa. They said, and then you came back here in the morning? The Prophet said, yes. And then they began mocking. Astaghfirullah. The Prophet they began clapping their hands and mocking the beloved Prophet And they thought, you know what? This is a big enormity. He's lying. Astaghfirullah. The beloved Prophet وسلم, was mocked by the people. One of the men said, how can you claim that you went there in one night and you've come back? It takes us one month on our camel to get there. How can you get there in one night? Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq spoke up. And he said, O oh people, how can you declare him a liar? He is speaking the truth. He is speaking the truth. And the people said, Oh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, you say that he is speaking the truth? How can you believe in him? He went to Masjid al-Aqsa. Be sensible. Be sensible. He said he went to Masjid al-Aqsa in one night. Be sensible. How, how can that be possible? Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Are you amazed that I've, I've accepted the fact that he's gone to Masjid al-Aqsa? Don't you realize that I believe in a word that he brings from the heavens every day and every morning? I believe in something that comes from afar. Even further than that, I believe in revelation that he brings from the heavens every day. And you're asking me how can I testify that he went to Palestine? I believe in the revelation that he brings from heaven. That is when the, the beloved Prophet named Abu Bakr Siddiq Siddiq. The trusting and the truthful. The trusting and the truthful. Siddiq was the one who trusted the Prophet when people were doubting him. This was the Iman and Yaqeen of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. Oh. Then they said, okay, then if you are speaking the truth, tell us then, what does Masjid al-Aqsa look like? So now they began testing him, sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet began describing Masjid al-Aqsa to them. Right? But then they started to ask him particular questions. Okay, how many doors does it have? Okay, how far is it from the mountain? Now, each and every one of us, think about your local park, just your local, just this masjid of yours. You know where this masjid is, you come here regularly, what not? But if somebody on the spot asked you the detail, how many doors does the masjid have? I don't think anyone could, have, could give me an answer right now. Even though you spent your life in this masjid. Agree? You'd have to think, right? One door, two door, three doors. Agree? The Prophet wasallam. see, they, they knew that he was speaking the truth, but they wanted to belie him. It's a silly question, how many doors does it have? I mean, once he's described it to you, that should be sufficient. He described it, and then after the description, they, said, they started asking all these silly questions. These are irre irre irrelevant questions. So they began asking. The Prophet وسلم, stood in the Hatim. You know the Hatim? You know the Kaaba has a, a round circular wall around it? There. The Prophet وسلم, stood there and he looked in direction of Al Masjid al Aqsa. And all the veils were removed 
from his side and from Masjid al-Aqsa and he counted the doors and he calculated the distance and he told them. This is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. Live, the Prophet was looking at the Masjid al-Aqsa. Live. He was looking, he counted the doors and he told them. He said, this is how many doors there are. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari. This hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Irresponsibly, alhamdulillah, telling me this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. These distances don't mean anything for the Prophet ﷺ. When Allah makes it happen, how can it be impossible for him to look that far? Rasulullah could be anywhere and he can see far. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills and makes it happen for him as a mu'jiza, who are me and you to question it or to stop him looking? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet stood in the hatim of the Kaaba. He looked at al-Masjid al-Aqsa live and he told them, this is how many doors it has and this is how far it is from the mountain. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then even though he told them all that description, they still were not having enough of it. So they said, okay, then did you meet any of our caravans on the way? Did you meet any of our caravans on the way? And the Prophet said, yes, I met these two caravans. He said, one of the caravans, they lost a camel. And I was thirsty, I took, thirsty, I took a, a bottle of water from that caravan. I drank from it and I left the bottle there in the caravan. And the other caravan of yours, yes, I saw it as well. It's at so-and-so place at the moment. It's on its way back to Mecca. And that, that caravan had a red camel in it. And it fell down and its load, its container broke. And there were people gathered around it in a stampede and I saw them. They thought, okay then, when are these camels coming? When are our caravans coming back then? Tell us, when are they, how far are they and when are they coming back? The Prophet ﷺ said, they will be back in Mecca in four days. Because the Prophet ﷺ had just come that route. The fourth day they came and all of the people of Mecca are waiting. Waiting for the caravans to come back because today they want to belie the Prophet ﷺ. They want to, show, they want to expose him, astaghfirullah, that he is lying. Astaghfirullah. I told you the return of the Prophet ﷺ is fascinating. The fourth day comes and it's time for evening. And the Prophet realizes that the caravans have not arrived. So the beloved Prophet makes dua. Oh Allah, increase the time of the day. That day was extended by one hour. That day was extended by one hour. And within that last hour of the day, both of the caravans that the Prophet spoke about arrived. <laughs> the people of Mecca went up to the caravans and they said, uh, Did any of you lose water from a bottle? One of them spoke, he said, Yes, I had water in a bottle, which I had in my caravan, and I didn't spill it, and I didn't leave it anywhere. I went looking out for a camel, and I come back and my bottle was empty. I don't know who drank it. And the Prophet was there, it was me who drank it. And they said, uh, the people of Mecca asked, did any of you lose a camel? And they said, yeah, one of the caravans said, yeah, we lost, a camel. we lost one of our camels on the way. So both of the things the Prophet told them were true. The third one was about the red camel that broke its load, right? So they asked, uh, guys, did, anyone, uh, did any of your camels fall and uh, break its load? They said, yes, our camel fell and it broke its load. Look, all the things the Prophet saw on the way back were true. But because their eyes were blind, you know what they said? They said, Oh Muhammad, we knew that you were a sorcerer and this is sorcery, this is magic. They accused him of magic at the end of all that. They accused the beloved Prophet of magic. At the end of all that. Because when the hearts are sealed, then there is no guidance. When the eyes are blind, then they will deny the existence of the sun. You can tell the blind person a million times that the sun is out today, and he will deny it a million times, saying, No, I don't believe you that the sun is out, because he can't see it. But to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he had no doubt about what the beloved Prophet was saying. So this was a, a, a short uh, introduction to the Isra and the Mi'raj of the beloved Prophet Indeed there are many lessons to be learnt from the, the Mi'raj, the miraculous night journey of the beloved Prophet And I finish with this, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that he uh, enriches our hearts with the seerah of the Prophet He brings us closer to knowing him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam.